Very warm welcome. And to all of you that are listening to us uh, either on television, Channel 404, or on radio, uh, on SAFM and Newsbreak on uh, Lotus FM, uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this, uh, the latest edition of the annual Lutuli Lecture, the annual Chief Albert Lutuli Memorial Lecture and Symposium. It's another opportunity for us uh, to take a look at the life and times of this remarkable man and the contribution that he made uh, in bringing us the democracy that we're celebrating the 20th year of. And this year's theme, Let My People Go, celebrating Chief Albert Lutuli and the foundations of our 20 years of freedom and democracy. And we have an exciting uh, lineup of speakers that are going to give us a little bit more insight into his contributions and perhaps a little bit of insight into his mind uh, that uh, led this man to become the first African to receive the Nobel Peace Laureate. Now, this uh, lecture comes under the auspices of the Lutuli Museum and the Department of Arts and Culture, as well as the University of KwaZulu-Natal. A little bit more on that uh, as the program unfolds. Uh, but this lecture forms part of the Lutuli National Legacy Project, uh, which is uh, one of the cabinet-approved national legacy projects. Uh, to acknowledge all South Africans whose heritage was uh, marginalized uh, during the apartheid rule. But uh, one of our guests, in fact, the Minister of Arts and Culture, Natim Teta, will tell us a little bit more about that uh, in a short while. Uh, now, you might be interested to know that uh, previous lectures uh, were delivered by uh, President Jacob Zuma, President Thabo Mbeki, uh, former President uh, Kenneth Kaunda of Zambia, and also the Mozambican President Joachim Chisano. So uh, a lot of esteemed people have come to honor uh, Chief Albert Lutuli uh, in one way or another during these annual lectures now in their 10th years. And this year, we're going to be focusing a little bit about uh, his legacy in terms of his values and his leadership, what relevance might they still have uh, uh, in today's society, and also two other interesting aspects that perhaps haven't been talked about so much in the previous times. Uh, one, we take a look at his Christian faith. Uh, how important was that to him, and what role did that play in his kind of leadership? And also his death. I mean, you know, the official accounts say that he was struck by a, good, a train, but perhaps there's a little bit more that needs to be dug up about that, the circumstances under which he passed away. So we'll explore that in this lecture as well. And we certainly want you to be part of that conversation. Uh, hashtag uh, Lutuli Lecture or at Arts Culture SA. Uh, if you want to contribute your conversation, uh, uh, contribute to the conversation as well. Okay, we've got a lot to get through. Uh, let me not chat too much uh, because I'd like to start this. And uh, today we're very uh, uh, lucky to have with us uh, the Falfa Soweto Choir that are going to lead us uh, in beginning this uh, lecture this year. Ladies and gentlemen, let's hear a word of song. Oh, no. 
Uh, for the choir that have uh, beautifully set up uh, this year's lecture. If you've just joined us, uh, we're in Durban today at the University of KwaZulu Natal, and in fact, we're at the Graduate School of Businesses Hall, and uh, we have an audience here that's going to be part of this conversation as we uh, take a look at uh, the legacy of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli. And I'm calling him Chief because at the time of his life that we're discussing, that's what he was. I know that uh, since then there have been uh, various versions and revisions of that, uh, words such as Nkosi, but I'll be referring to him throughout as uh, Chief Albert Lutuli, and we'll be having that conversation with a number of people today, and I'll introduce them to you in a short while. But before that, I think just to get a good sense of uh, this man and uh, why he's so revered in this part of the world, for those of you that are watching from beyond our borders, and why, when we tell the history of South Africa, uh, that some names feature more prominently, and he truly was uh, a son of uh, this country. So we've got this little background piece, this video piece that will take us show us some glimpses of his life, particularly one of the highlights, I think, when he received the Nobel Peace Prize in Oslo in Norway. Let's take a look at Chief Albert Lutuli. as an endorsement of our own struggle in South Africa and the manner in which we have tried to carry out that struggle under very difficult circumstances in our country. And the award is a great encouragement uh, to all of us. For I must say, I regarded the award as not just to Albert Tutuli, but to South Africa, particularly to the struggling people of South Africa.
Whatever may be the future of our freedom efforts, our cause is the cause of the liberation of people who are denied freedom. Only on this basis can the peace of Africa and the world be firmly founded. Our cause is the cause of equality between nations and people. Only thus can the brotherhood of men be firmly established. It is encouraging and elating to remind you that despite her humiliation and torment at the hands of white rule, the spirit of Africa in the quest for freedom has been generally for peaceful means to the utmost. So images there of uh, Chief Albert Mutuli, particularly at the time that he received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, in Oslo, Norway. And the first African to do so, and I think has left a rich legacy uh, for others to follow. And he certainly uh, made his contribution to the freedoms that we're celebrating, uh, particularly now in the 20th year of uh, our democracy. So today... Uh, we're celebrating him and we're remembering him and talking about uh, the kind of leadership that he le left behind for us to follow uh, in uh, this uh, uh, 20 years of democracy. Um, as I said a little bit earlier on, these annual lectures are held under the auspices of the Lutuli Museum, the Department of Arts and Culture, and also the University of KwaZulu-Natal, where we are at the moment. And just to perhaps give us a word of welcome and uh, share her thoughts on the role that the university has been playing uh, in these uh, lectures, I'd like to call upon the Deputy Vice-Chancellor at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, uh, Professor Cheryl Portkeeter. Program Director, Minister of Arts and Culture, Mr. Nati Matetwa, Lutuli Museum Chairperson, Mr. Jabalani Satoli, Dr. Albertina Lutuli, and members of the Lutuli family, members of the Executive of UKZN, alumni, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed, and a very good afternoon to you. On behalf of the Council and the Executive Management of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, I would like to welcome you to the suspicious occasion, the annual Lutuli lecture. Today's lecture is particularly significant as we celebrate 20 years of our democracy. It is also an important event for the University of KwaZulu-Natal as we celebrate our 10-year anniversary as a merged institution. The university seeks to contribute towards a just society by promoting the vision and values of Chief Albert Lutuli through producing and disseminating new knowledge which is relevant to our country, our continent, and indeed globally. One of the ways of contributing is convening discussion platforms such as this annual lecture, where we as a nation can talk and critically engage around important issues which promote social cohesion and ultimately contributes to a South Africa which reflects the values of Dr. Albert Lutuli. Dialogue is an integral to the legacy of Dr. Albert Lutuli, as much of his work entails speaking, listening, and getting people to talk and listen to each other, and this annual lecture in his memory has the same objective. However, as his speeches indicate, he was a revolutionary and understood the role of various interventions in his fight for an equitable and democratic South Africa. Dr. Albert Lutuli discounts the notion that our continent and indeed our country did not have black intellectuals and scholars, and it also discounts the notion that the African National Congress does not have a long tradition of leaders who have been both revolutionaries and intellectuals. Dr. Albert Lutuli was awarded an honorary doctorate almost 50 years ago to the day. On the 30th of November, 1964, by the University of Algiers. 
Four years later, he received the Nobel Peace Prize. The university is honored to be associated with Albert de Tully, the university's vision to be the premium University of African scholarship commits us to the potential of Africa and to making a vital contribution to the world. It is scholarship that celebrates diversity and promotes democracy, equality, equity, justice, development, and intellectual humility. The theme for this year's symposium, Let My People Go, celebrating Chief Albert de Tully in the foundation of 20 years of freedom and democracy, creates a platform for productive and successful deliberations. This annual lecture is an opportunity to evaluate how far our society has progressed towards the re realization of his vision, the vision of the African National Congress which he led, and we are indeed evaluating the following. How far have we progressed in implementing the values and spirit of the constitution of our 20-year-old democracy? And what needs to be done to complete the journey towards a just, equitable, and social cohesive society? In closing my welcome to you, I could not find a better excerpt than from Dr. Latuli's acceptance speech when he received the Nobel Peace Prize. His words ring true today as it did five decades ago. I quote, open quote, let me invite Africa to cast her eyes beyond the past and to some extent the present with their woes and tribulations, trials and failures and some successes and see herself as an emergent continent bursting to freedom through the shell of centuries of serfdom. This is Africa's age, the dawn of her fulfillment. Yes, when she must grapple with destiny to reach the summits of the summit saying, ours was a fight for noble values and worthy ends. Once again, I welcome you to the University of KwaZulu-Natal and the annual Dr. Albert Latuli Lecture. I thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our thanks, ladies and gentlemen, to the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Cheryl Portkeeter, for sharing her thoughts with us and uh, why the University of KwaZulu-Natal is uh, graciously hosting us, but also an integral part of uh, these annual lectures uh, that we're celebrating today. And as I said in previous years, we've had uh, very famous people that have, uh, and important people that have come to uh, share their thoughts with us on Chief Albert Lutuli, President Jacob Zuma, uh, President Thabo Mbeki, Joachim Chisana, just to name a few, and Frini Jimwala as well, former Speaker of the National Assembly. Well, today it's taking a slightly different format. We've got a, uh, a panel of speakers that are going to help us through a symposium uh, to explore uh, various aspects of Chief Albert Lutuli's life. And I'm going to be introducing them to you now just to see who's sitting next to us. And a little bit later on, we'll get to hear their thoughts. And uh, first of all is the uh, Honorable Minister of Arts and Culture, uh, Mr. Natim Tetwa. Thank you very much indeed for joining us and uh, welcome. Uh, next to you, we have uh, Mr. Uh, Jabulani Sitole, who's the Provincial Coordinator for the KZN Liberation Heritage Route. Welcome to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Jabulani uh, Mzalia, Special Advisor to the Minister in the Presidency. Welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Professor Smangaliso Kumalo is an Associate Professor of the School of Religion, University of KwaZulu-Natal, and also Director uh, at uh, Ujama. Thank you very much indeed for joining us. And we look forward to hearing all of your thoughts uh, on the various aspects of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli's life. But I want to start with you, Minister. Uh, we know that the Lutuli Museum is a legacy project, and it's uh, one of the uh, Cabinet-approved national legacy projects particularly aimed at acknowledging um, those heroes that have contributed so much uh, to uh, the lives of uh, uh, South Africans that uh, we are now enjoying this democracy, many who've lost their lives uh, to end apartheid. And I know that 
for you uh, to be here is, is a great honor for us, but I think also uh, uh, an opportunity for you to share with us your thoughts at the Departments of Arts and Culture, why such lectures are so important. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Honorable Minister of Arts and Culture, uh, Mr. Natim Teto. Thank you, uh, Program Director, Mr. Peter Noro, uh, to the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Professor Potriter, the Lutuli family, the Lutuli Foundation, distinguished speakers, comrades and friends, members of the media, fellow South Africans. We meet here today to celebrate the life and legacy of a great leader and statesman, and statesman, Chief Albert Lutuli. We are reminded of how far we come and indeed how many people individually and collectively paved the way for our freedom. We are grateful to them that we are amongst those who made it to the victory line. We are also privileged to be amongst those who inherited the title deed to the future. The preamble of the Constitution of the Republic joins us to, amongst others, I quote, recognize the injustices of our past, honor those who suffered for justice and freedom in our land, respect those who have worked to build and develop our country, and believe that South Africa belongs to all who live in it, united in our diversity. Twenty years ago was the culmination of a 300 years of struggle that brought us to the point in our history where we could say definitely that we had seized the moment and entered a new space and a new era. We had embarked upon a new road to the building of a united non-racial, non-sexist democratic South Africa. We stand on the shoulders of those giants who showed rare stoicism in the fight against colonialism and apartheid. The Khoisan wars of resistance against colonial settlers in the Cape, those who had perished on the Eastern Cape frontier wars and resisted colonial imposition for more than two centuries. Those who laid their, down their lives in the battle in Piring in 1838, led by King Sikwati of Bapedi, defeating the, invader, the invaders thus demonstrating to all of us that our colonizers were not that invincible. Those who showed us and the world the glimmer of hope at the Battle of San Luana and through Pambata's rebellion. Those women who taught their people never to dishonor the cause of freedom. We speak of the likes of Princess Mkaba Igajama, Queen Lobatsibeni, Queen Mandandise, to those who brought new methods of struggle like Ma Charlotte McClegge, Ma Lowe, Ma Khabashane, to mention but a few. Those who organized and united under the banner of a giant political organization born in Mangaung that would lead the fight for the establishment of a united, non-racial, non-sexist, democratic, and prosperous society. Those who perish in detention those who endured unjust trials and long years in prison, those who took to the streets in defiance of unjust laws, those mothers and fathers who never knew if their children would ever come back home, those who were tortured, banned, banished, murdered because they fought for humanity, for freedom, those who took up arms against the oppressor, those in the neighboring countries who suffered because of their solidarity with our struggle. Those in the anti-apartheid movement who stood up even against their own governments and selflessly donated to our cause. Those who led their countries yet whose lives were cut short by the apartheid regime because they supported our cause. The likes of Olof Palm, Samora Marshall, and others. Those whose lives were brutally terminated because they fought for freedom, the likes of Wisi Lemini, Wilson Kainga, Zinagile Mkaba, 
who walked triumphantly to the gallows and broke into a song heroically, warning the then Prime Minister Fervut thus, Nancy Ndotemnyama Fervut, Pasopa Nancy Ndotemnyama Fervut, Solomon Mashang, who walked gallantly to the gallows and said, my blood will nourish the tree that will bear the fruits of freedom. The struggle taught us, as President O. R. Tambo would say, that as we capture the state power, we need to use it to advance the objectives of fundamental social transformation. The struggle produced hope and confidence, enabling us to transform our reality. Chief Albert Lutuli was one such hero on the road to freedom whose contribution and ideas still shine brightly in our midst. Not content to be an island unto himself, he took up the mantle of leadership. Throughout his life, there were milestones that would further conscientize, politicize, and take him to higher levels of service. Chief Lutuli was a profound thinker, a scholar, a man of powerful logic with a keen sense of justice, a man of lofty principles, a bold and courageous fighter and a statesman. He was a true African nationalist and an unflinching patriot. Although he grew up under tribal conditions and surroundings, he was uncompromising against, racia non against racialism, tribalism, and all forms of sectoral exclusion. He believed in and fought for full political, economic, and social opportunities for the oppressed people of South Africa, regardless of color of creed, nationality, or racial origin. A staunch anti-imperialist, anti-colonialist, he fought and obtained the cooperation of all anti-apartheid, anti-imperialist progressive movements and organizations in our country and abroad. When he was stripped of his chieftaincy, because he refused to resign from the African National Congress, he acknowledged that the path of moderation that he had taken for more than 30 years had not borne any fruit. Chief Lutuli then declared, and I quote, the past 30 years have seen the greatest number of laws restricting our rights and progress until, to, until today we have reached a stage where we have almost no rights at all. It is with this background and with a full sense of responsibility that under the auspices of the African National Congress, I have joined my people in the new spirit that moves them today, the spirit that revolves openly and boldly against injustice and expresses itself in a determined and nonviolent manner. He, con he concluded by asserting that he would remain in the struggle for extending democratic rights and responsibilities to all sections of South African people. What the future has in store for me, I do not know. It might be ridicule, imprisonment, concentration camp, flogging, banishment, and even death. It is inevitable that in working for freedom, some individuals and some families must take lead and suffer. The road to freedom is via the cross." Close quote. As a leader and president general of the African National Congress in the 1950s, Chief Lutuli was known for his unwavering commitment and as an insightful and eloquent voice for the African struggle for freedom and self-determination. He was amongst those who were put on trial but remained steadfast. He fused African tradition Christianity and modernity. In so doing, he managed to take a perspective that combined different ways of seeing into one coherent vision, a totality of reflection and action. To paraphrase Paul Frey in his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he could have been speaking of Chief Lutuli when he described the qualities of leadership needed to bring about change. He said, and I quote, the individual is not, this individual is not afraid to confront, to listen, to see the world unveiled. The, the, this person is not afraid to meet the people or to enter into dialogue with them. 
This person does not consider himself the proprietor of history or of all people or the liberator of the oppressed, but he does commit himself within history to fight at their side. Close quote. Chief Lutuli was a man of whom one can say that the struggle for freedom was part of his understanding of the gospel, and this reinforced his sense of having a calling in life. He embraced the notion of serving the people and working for the greater good for all. For him, the important values of life would include service, sacrifice, duty, equality, and at the heart of his endeavor was a strong humanistic spirit that prevailed even in the darkest times. In 1958, he pointed out, and I quote, I personally believe that here in South Africa, with all our diversities of color and race, we'll show the world a new pattern for democracy, close quote. In this way, he addressed a complex issue of national identity beyond race and espoused the ideal that South Africa should be a country where everyone belongs and all are at home. Because of his work, he was granted the Nobel Peace Prize in, 19, in 1960 and became the first African in the entire continent to receive the award. But modestly, he saw South African struggle as part of contributing towards world peace and acknowledged that in fighting oppression and, in, and discrimination and through the award, I quote, we are serving our fellow men the world over. He was not alone in showing us the path to a better future. From Pixley Isaga Seme to Sol Blatke, from Charlotte McClegge to Moses Kotane, from Clemens Kadali to Edwin Tabum Fusanyana, to J.P. Marx and Ray Alexander, to Tata Mandela and his comrades, to the class of 1976, the 80s and beyond, that President O.R. Tambo described as the young lions. They have all paved the road to freedom. Chief Lutuli is contemporary at Adams College. Professor Z.K. Matthews spoke of an African awakening. He said, and I quote, it is in, in the minds of Africans that revolutions which are rocking the foundations of African societies are taking place, close quote. In this way, his words echoed that of Pixley Isaka Seme, when in 1906 called for the regeneration of Africa. Nandi Azikwe, the president of Nigeria in 1937, also spoke of the Renaissance Africa. He said, conceived in the indestructible nature of the spirit and born of a selfless desire to utilize culture for the service of humanity, it is destined that the, the Renaissance Africans must carry the torch of this gospel of the new awakening from west to east, from north to south Africa, close quotes. These words could equally describe Chief Albert Lutuli, who was the embodiment of the living spirit of this idea, the gospel of service, the shining light, and the one who put trust in the ideal of, of humanity and more humane world. Ours was no easy walk to was no easy work, as Madiba would say. But indeed, there are many more hills to cross. We have traveled a long journey since the days in which Africa's rebirth and liberation were first articulated. As we grapple with the radical transformation of the economy, the implementation of the National Development Plan, and Africa's Agenda 2063, let us do so, inspired by the life of Chief Lutul. He knew perhaps better than we do, that the road to social progress is always under construction. He knew that we should travel this road armed with spirituality, freedom of thinking, regeneration, economic liberation, and political consciousness. We need to keep our sense of faith that freedom-loving people over the world have on us, and we need to be able to complete the work in building a truly equal, just, and just society, where economic prosperity is not the preserve of a few, but benefits all. And finally, we pledge 
in this 20th year of our freedom that we shall indeed show the world a new pattern for democracy, as President Lutuli said. Thank you very much. Lisa, thank you very much indeed. Uh, the Honourable Minister of Arts and Culture, Mr. Natim Tetwa, thank you very much indeed for sharing your thoughts with us on uh, Chief Albert Lutuli at this annual lecture and symposium. And uh, as he said, you know, his contributions still shine brightly after all these years. And I think he perhaps uh, best celebrates uh, all that is embodied when we talk about uh, servant leadership. And uh, I think it's fair to say he's a man that uh, truly represented the best of our people. He was always steadfast in his uh, principles, unwavering commitment into uh, to serving uh, the people and fighting against uh, injustice and oppression, uh, serving people right to the end, often at great cost to himself. And uh, you mentioned a number of heroes and heroines, and uh, we're grateful that the Department of Arts and Culture is uh, preserving their memory uh, through national legacy projects such as the Lutuli Museum. So, uh, Minister Natim Tetwa, thank you very much indeed, sir, for sharing your thoughts with us. Okay, so. Um, as I said, this annual lecture, we're taking a different sort of format this year as having the symposium and we're going to have an opportunity to have a question and answer session with our audience here at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. But you also at home, if you can tweet, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, but we're going to try and unpack this man a little bit for you. Um, we're going to look at three aspects uh, of uh, his life. I mean, he, he wore many hats. You know, he was an educator, church leader, traditional leader, freedom fighter, many roles. So we're going to try and chip away at some of those and just try and get a sense of what was it about this man that uh, the international community through the uh, Nobel uh, Prize would recognize him um, in the way that he did. So um, we've got, as I said, we introduced a few of our speakers earlier on, but I'd like to call upon now um, Mr. Satolo, who's a former lecturer, uh, academic himself in historical, in, in historical and uh, uh, affairs, and uh, also currently the KwaZulu-Natal Provincial Coordinator of the Liberation Heritage Route uh, in the National Heritage Council. And he's going to be exploring for us the values that uh, f uh, 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 Chief Lutula bequeathed to us and what those relevance are in this day and age. So please put your hands together, ladies and gentlemen, for Mr. Jabulani Satole, project leader for the KwaZulu Natal Liberation Heritage Route. Thank you, Program Director, Mr. Peter Ndoro, uh, Minister Mchetwa, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Pro Professor Potfiter, the members of the Lutuli family and the Lutuli Foundation. I don't want to miss your face. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, the objective of what I would want to do is twofold. The first uh, is to outline very briefly a randomly chosen sort of values that I think I should like to highlight that Lutuli live by. And then, of course, pose the key question, as Mr. Ndoro uh, has highlighted, of their relevance in the world we live in today. But to start off, I think it's important to reiterate the position that has been put across here, uh, uh, the view or the question of who Chief Lutuli was. Chief Albert Lutuli was an educator, a leader within his church, a democratic elected traditional leader. I must emphasize in this case, often we take that uh, traditional leaders are hereditary. In his community, they used to actually hold elections regularly, and the best candidates who represented the values that were seen to be quite important was elected, and therefore uh, making or modernizing an institution that was seen as being backward into something more modern because it was a democratic process. He was the president of the ANC, but much more importantly, has been put before, the first African to be awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in recognition of his outstanding contributions and efforts to the cause of human freedom, human dignity, uh, non-racialism, democracy, and peace in South Africa, in Africa, and the world. He remains one of the major figures in the African liberation politics who enjoyed enormous popularity and respect from the within the ranks of the then ANC that he led in the 1950s and the 60s, but much more importantly, the kind of respect that extended beyond the, the ANC. We are told that in the 1950s, 
members of the Liberal Party had so much respect for Chief Albert Lutuli to a point where they wanted to claim very informally that they would have loved to actually see him as one of their, their own. But besides actually receiving the Nobel Prize, Lutuli was a recipient of quite a number of other prizes. In the, at about the same time as the receipt of the Nobel Prize in 1960, he received the Christopher Gell Memorial Award uh, in absentia uh, because he was actually busy with Nobel Prize. In 1974, the Organization of African Unity posthumously bestowed on him the Merit Award in recognition of his tireless fight for the liberation of the, of the people of South Africa, Africa, and of course, the world. Now, what is it then, of course, that uh, motivated Lutuli to do all these things and get this kind of recognition? As I said earlier on, there are several values that we can actually highlight, but I've chosen to actually look at least five. One of them is that Lutuli had a deep commitment in being a leader that spent his entire life to the service of humanity. His joining the struggle at the time was more like a selfless sacrifice, and it is best demonstrated by the decision that he took in 1936, when he was called upon by his own community to come and serve as a chief. It is unthinkable that at the time he would actually resign a position that earned him a decent salary for the one where he was not going to earn any salary, but where he respected the call of his own community that they needed to be provided with the political leadership. So if that was not an example of your service to humanity, we need to begin to ask different set of questions. But I must emphasize that that came at a personal sacrifice, not to him only, but also to the family, because the one point that we often miss is that around this time, the Authorities in South Africa never allowed women teachers who were married to carry on being teachers. Once they were married, they were forced to resign and go and serve as housewives, which would actually be quite important for those within academia and society generally who are thinking about this kind of discrimination. But here was Lutul, he was able to say, when weighing all sorts of uh, factors that were put before him, and felt that the call by his own people was, quite, was much more important. So that's the emphasis that, that was there, that service to humanity. Secondly, he believed in non-racial democracy. He held the view that you could not actually withhold freedom from other people that you needed to share freedom because it was so precious that it would be very selfish to keep it from other people. But looking at the conditions in South Africa, he felt it was extremely important for those who were engaged in the struggle, not only to talk about the liberation of the African majority in general and the black people in, in I mean, African majority in particular in general, and the, Afri the African people in particular and the, the black majority in general, but it was extremely important to ensure that you educate the white population that form about 20% to realize that it was very abnormal for them to accept that the society was okay if more than 80% of the population was oppressed. It was that kind of deep commitment, but a commitment, of course, that would extend to a point where you actually talk about a genuine uh, equality, not only of races, but equality, of course, of genders. It will take me to the next point, that uh, around the 1950s, we witnessed more participation of women in the struggle for freedom under the leadership of Albert Lutuli, who had actually demonstrated before he became a leader of the ANC that it was necessary to include women in your public affairs. Within his own chiefdom, he was able to invite women to participate in the council something that was unthinkable, was, was uh, never actually regarded as important, that your traditional councils should have women participating, yet Lutuli's council had women who were participating and playing an active role. But in addition to that, he was able then to extend that beyond just his own chiefdom and begin to encourage the ANC and many other liberation forces to mobilize women because he believed and he shared these views with other leaders at the time that if you mobilize women and the youth, you would have mobilized the vast majority of people to participate in the struggle, and therefore you'd speed up the possibility of freedom in South Africa. Now, fourthly, he believed in a people-centered program of action, 
that when you actually embark on any politics, the value that should drive you is to put people at the center of your interests rather than your selfish interests. But lastly, I must say, he was one person who believed in your non-racial politics, but also believed in your alliance politics. And he's fondly remembered in this country as the father of your alliance politics. But then, of course, the key point is, if these values were important, of what relevance are they today? Are they there today? If Lutuli were to rise miraculously, and miraculously and be amongst us, what do they say about our performance, both as a country, the continent, and the world? Surely Lutuli would have mixed feelings about what we are doing, not only in South Africa, but in the continent and beyond. He would appreciate, as many other people across the world have appreciated, that his countrymen and women were able to achieve an important stage of democracy and freedom in South Africa by sitting down and negotiating uh, a dispensation that would actually be based on the principles that his generation had sacrificed for, that of uh, equality, non-racialism, non-sexism, and people-centered democracy. He would undoubtedly be proud of the achievements that South Africa has actually made in taking these sort of values beyond our own borders, the roles that we've played in the DRC, that we've played in Burundi, in Sudan, and elsewhere to ensure that the route of peace and uh, negotiation is quite important. You would also be very proud and, uh, uh, of the achievement that we have actually had in the last 20 years. But much more equally, I must say, he would actually be quite critical of the slow pace of change that you are achieving. He would actually be saying a society uh, that is unfolding around the world, both politically and economically, that tends to put more emphasis on social inequalities where only a handful of people enjoy the riches and there is so much opulence. And on the other hand, the vast majority of people are, are, are subjected to poverty is a political and social system that should continue to be challenged. You would be asking questions around what has happened to Ubuntu and what has happened to the very principles of pushing people at the center of what we're doing, particularly the vulnerable and the poorest of the poor, not only in, as we say, in our country, but in the continent and the world. As a recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize, he would actually be condemning the acts of violence, the wars that were witnessing, especially at the beginning of the 20th century. He would actually be saying on the one hand, whilst it's extremely important that we condemn dictatorships so where we see them emerging, where we condemn any oppression of a person or a group of people over others, he would actually be condemning the methods that have been used to effect the kinds of changes. The term that I think is quite much more popular in our days, we're talking of regime change. He would actually be pointing out that in the process of effecting that regime change, what tends to happen is that the, major, the vast majority of people who die become statistics. In various countries, you would actually be hearing that within a very few days, in the change of the regime in Iraq, more than 100,000 people have died. If you go on and look at the statistics 10 years on, you realize that there are large numbers of people. And the principal leadership, like Lack of Lutuli, would begin to condemn those sort of things, not only there in Libya, in Ukraine, and elsewhere, because the struggle he understood was not only national and continental, but was a human struggle that had to be fought in various parts of the world. He would also uh, be quite critical of our recent very shameful acts that South Africa witnessed where we attacked the African of P uh, dark pigmentation in what was known as the xenophobic uh, attacks. He would remind us that these are the very people who sacrificed and extended their hand of friendship to our own when we needed to actually be secured and protected against apartheid uh, tyranny. He would actually again be asking what has happened to us why don't we make an introspection and question why we would actually be, demo, be, 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 be working against and uh, discriminating against people of African descent because of the color of their skin, whereas we don't do that with the rest of the people. Basically, in short, Lutuli would certainly commend South Africa and the African continent, and I think globally, where good things are being done, but he would equally be expressing constructive criticism where we think we have faltered so as to urge us to improve our act 
and live up to the expectations of the masses of the people who yearn for human dignity and justice. He would call for a, a people-centered program of action in the struggle to improve the lives of the people in South Africa and in Africa and the world. He would have regarded such an approach as the very basis upon which responsible leadership is exercised. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Mr. Jabulai. Mr. Tole is a provincial coordinator at the University of uh, KwaZulu-Natal uh, at the KwaZulu-Natal Liberation Heritage Route. Thank you for some powerful insights there on uh, some aspects of the, uh, the nature and the leadership of uh, uh, Chief Albert Lutuli. And uh, as you said, I think uh, one of his hallmarks was uh, alliance politics. He was uh, very well known for bringing people together, particularly those of uh, deferring views. And he enjoyed the debates, uh, but certainly had a way in uh, bringing people together. And uh, thank you for sharing his, uh, uh, your thoughts on some of uh, uh, what he would have seen as achievements uh, that we've had in the, in the last 20 years, particularly at home and also uh, in the region as well. And as you said, perhaps uh, some concerns that he would have had, particularly around the so pace of dealing uh, with inequality, especially when one considers that uh, despite his stature and international repute, he lived very modestly amongst the people and he was very much a grassroots kind of uh, leader. And you also spoke about uh, discrimination that would have concerned him, particularly around uh, people in, in, uh, in other parts of the continent. People-centered, uh, I think you described him. And uh, we, we thank you very much for bringing those values uh, the, to us and reminding us uh, a little bit more about uh, this man, uh, Professor Albert, uh, the, uh, Chief Albert Lutuli, uh, today. All right, so that's kind of his leadership, his, uh, the man himself. And I said that there were two other aspects that we'd like to explore a little bit today. Uh, and one of them is very rarely talked about. In fact, when the story broke, people kind of accepted what had, had happened and uh, hadn't really been challenged a lot. Um, a hero at home, but also a man of international repute. Uh, in 1966, uh, Chief Albert Lutuli visited the United States. Uh, Senator Robert Kennedy wanted to hear a little bit about uh, Lutuli's vision for uh, South Africa. And it was just a year later, uh, 21st July 1967, uh, that uh, Chief Lutuli died, allegedly being struck by a goods train as he was crossing a railway bridge. Well, that was the simple story that was told, and an inquest was held, but it was held at a time where perhaps uh, things were not really that open. And so perhaps to explore a little bit about this death, was there more to this, is uh, Dr. Jabulanu, uh, Jabulani uh, Mzalia, who is currently the Special Advisor to the Minister in the Presidency Monitoring and Evaluation. Uh, please take to the stage and share with us your thoughts on uh, this, perhaps a mystery that hasn't really been fully explored as yet. Program Director, Minister Natim Tetwa, the Lutuli family, the Lutuli Foundation, ladies and gentlemen. I've titled my talk, Death by a Train, number 332, the Manga Manga story of Chief Albert Lutuli's mysterious death. My intention is in this contribution is to locate the mysterious death of Chief Albert Lutuli on 21st July 1967 of fractured skull, cerebral hemorrhage, and contusion of the brain when he was struck by a goods train accidentally within the poisonous environment of mysterious deaths of unifying African leaders who took, which took place between 1960 and 19, 1970. The list is long. Dr. Felix Ronald Momue of the Cameroons of Talian poisoning on November 3, 1960. Patrice Lumumba of the Congo by firing squad on 17 January 1961. And four days later, to hide evidence his body was hexawed and dissolved in sulfuric acid. President, Togo, President of Togo, Silvanus Olympio, in a coup d'etat on 13 January 1963, the leader of the Moroccan opposition, Mehdi Ben Barker, known as a traveling salesman of the revolution, kidnapped in France in 1965 and his body never, never found. Tom Boyer, gunned down on, five, on the 5th of July 1969 in a Mombasa pharmacy. Eduardo Mondlane, leader of Relimo, by a parcel bomb in Tanzania in 1969. 
I will use only three assassinations, Lumumba's, Momiers, and Monlane's as stimuli to expand on the assassination theme and to expo expose the pattern of the assassinations. I do not want to give the impression that raising this issue of Lutuli's death is my novel idea. Many have raised it, but have not had the opportunity to reduce it to writing. Those who have reduced it to writing include Kumalo. He identifies Cooper, as I also do, as one of those who put, who punt the train accident idea. After stating that his body was found on a railway tra track, he invites, invites us to raise a little detective skills in us. Being found on a railway track does not mean you were killed there. Answering questions from Mr. A. M. Wilson, instructed by Bengu, Tabashi, and company on behalf of the family, Dr. Gwendolyn Gregerson indicated that the chief's clothing was torn and dirty, which clearly showed that he had been thrown a distance by the impact. In my view, the death could not have come from where he was thrown to, but from where he was brought from. In his analysis on why Lutuli was a better man to take over from Morocco, from, from Morocco, Oliver Tambo had stated that Lutuli's widow, Mama Nokanya, had not believed the story of how Lutuli had died, and neither did the ANC. Former President Nelson Mandela expressed the same sentiment in his long walk to freedom. He stated, the circumstances were curious. He had been hit by a train in an area near his farm where he often walked. Kumalo makes an observation, which I agree with. And I quote, knowing the capability of the security agents of the apartheid era, it is still possible that they killed him and then covered their tracks in order to subvert the facts. Both Kumalo and I dismissed the notion by Cooper that the apartheid state had no reason to kill him because it would martyr him. The first objection to Cooper's assertion is that here we are, 47 years later, still symposiuming about the chief Lutuli's death. The second one is that Cooper's approach of a too Christianized Lutuli robs Cooper of understanding not only to Lutuli's politics, but also the political environment under which he operated. Sitole and Mkiza make the point that Lutuli's family maintains that he was deliberately rather than accidentally dead, killed. The assertion is corroborated by the alleged use of inchumenchu in the train accident. I will add my environmental scan and circumstantial views to the ones they have made. Looking into the past is a victim of disarming phraseologies. Having studied and loved history for my earlier career in education, I naturally do not subscribe to the idea of letting bygones be bygones. Let us not open old wounds. Let's look to the future, forgive and forget. Let us all live together as one nation. The sins of our parents are not our sins. I believe that all these dissuasive phrases, loosely used, are unintellectual as they are, are historic. I'm aware of the phrases that are used to describe people like us who pursue what I seek to pursue. We are referred to as alternative historians, conspiracy buffs, revisionist histor historians. We are accused of, being, of failing to produce the smoking gun or relying on circumstantial evidence. Machikli Aubrey has provided, what, provided what, you, what you call an apothegm of this argument to the smoking gun when he states, the absence of evidence is not the evidence of absence. Like, like the assassinated leaders, Lutuli was a unifier. Unified in him was a Christian, the politician, the farmer, the teacher, the father, the preacher, the leader. It meant that he could cross, cut across all these and unify them. But also unify the educated Izifundiswa with the uneducated Amakaba, the urban and the rural. In Stenga, he had friends of Indian extraction whom he referred to as Abathobobami. He was once an executive member of the white-led South African Institute of Race Relations. Lutuli's ban was once lifted, and he went on tour to speak to mixed audiences. He was a member and president of the African National Congress. But more importantly, he did not want, he worked with communists, including, uh, most particularly, Moses Kotane. For him, it was not a singular domination of one race over, over, uh, over the other. In his ideal world, he included Chinese, Egyptian, Jewish, European, and went on to say that when these were together, there would be no black, but, quote, all will be African. Having crafted a platform where this matter should have been put to bed through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it was disappointing that there was neither oral no documentary evidence to bring some light on this unfinished business of Lutuli's death. The prevailing conclusion, at least from the sources that I've, I've researched, 
for this contribution takes the line that Lutuli was knocked by a train. The Natal witness went on further to rubbish those who believed in the conspiracy theories. One of them, one of, or one of the articles was reviewing Cooper's paper. Quote, there is no evidence, medical or otherwise, to suggest anything else than the train accident version. Genuine accidents happened even in the apartheid South Africa, but conspiracy theory has a powerful appeal to lazy academics and political scoundrels. Everything aside, the government had no particular reason to eliminate Lutuli and will only have created a martyr out of an organizationally isolated individual, unquote. In 1998, the chairperson of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, sorry, Recon 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 Commission, Emeritus, Emeritus Archbishop Desmond Tutu published eight letters for the attention of the United Nations. In these letters, it suggested that two foreign intelligence organizations and a South African intelligence organizations were involved in the United States, sorry, Secretary General, Dach called planes crash. The United Nations dismissed the idea as a Soviet conspiracy. There is also an obvious discord in this discourse. How was it easier for the TRC person such a person to need to gather an event that happened in 1961 in Dola, Zambia, but get nothing about the event which happened between Klego, Kledo and Stenga stations in 1967. A few questions should point to the direction the fresh inquiry should take. Why would Lutuli, who had made this habitual walk, as Benson observed, be exposed, exposed to such mortal danger on that particular day? Both Ernest Mferga and Mama Lutuli admitted that the, 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 at the inquest that this bridge They've used this bridge often, including themselves. The engine driver also admitted that after working the route for 20 years, people were always crossing that bridge, but there had never been a death before. There is an added blame that is made by emphasizing the railway sign that said people were entering the bridge at their own risks. The affidavit sought to make people believe that Tuli carelessly took the risk of walking on that bridge, and the railway official should not be blamed but he should, be blamed, he should be blamed for his indiscretion. The idea of a small shop near the railway line also corroborates my assertion that Lutuli was aware of train times and could not have been on the railway line at the time he knew that the train was coming. Distance also comes into play if one interrogates the issue of the new bridge under construction some distance from the old bridge where Lutuli was hit by a train. Two days earlier, that is on the 19th of January 1967, his wife, Mama Nokanya, Lutuli had accompanied him to the fields. Because he was, she was going to remain behind the fields, she advised him to use the new bridge under construction because it was safe, a safer way of crossing the bridge and a shorter route to their general store. Two days later, why would Lutuli go back to this old bridge? The psychology of the, or the common sense of walking tends towards a shorter and safer route than a long and dangerous one. Train guard Van Veig who testified at the inquest, is also a person of interest. The accident happened at 10.38. From his guard truck, he first looked to the front of the train to find out what had happened. He then looked back to see a bantu lying down. He put the stoppers so that the train could not reverse. Then Van Vig walked to the railway telephone to phone the station master of, Kled of, of Kledo. The station master called the amb Stenger Hospital Ambulance. Ambulance drivers say they received a call at 10.40 a.m. That is two minutes. This could not have been done. All this could not have been done in two minutes. Another issue of concern is the color of the shoes that Lutuli wore on that day. Mama Nogukanya, who last saw him off in the morning on the 21st July 1967, maintained that he was wearing black shoes. The guard Van Veig stated at the inquest that he was wearing brown shoes. The day was bright. There was supposed to be a thorough check on firemen trailing. He's also a person of interest. At the inquest, he gave the res his residential address as living in a hotel, St. Andrew's Hotel in Devon. I do not think that a mere fireman could afford to reside in a hotel at his salary. My assessment of this testimony to the, inqu to the inquest was that he was the most evasive, with most of his answers to the questions being a ganiseni. In her address to the Mandela Center of Memory, Lutuli's daughter, Dr. Albertina, stated that she met a woman who had met Lutuli on that fateful day. She was with two other women. The chief told them that they would go strong, and he also taught them about the value of education in their lives. 
So in a sense, there was a person or persons that the chief spoke to to this before his mysterious death. Yet these two people were not called to testify at the commission. In the case of the death of United Secretary General Dakia Maskol, those villagers who witnessed the plane crash alleged that they were told not to talk about the accident again. This was on the pain of suffering if they divulged. The issue of Secretary General's death still haunts the members of the Hamaskos family in much the same way that it still haunts the Litulu family. In the absence of evidence about his death, as Machika has said, the line that it was a self-inflicted death dominates public scholarship and is to an extent perpetuated by some of the people who, know, who say they know him. There is an added confusion which is brought by medical reports. One report says there were several and multiple injuries, while Pile said there was only one injury. According to Sitole, Mama Nukanya asserted that her husband was struck by a long object in Chumenchu, which left a hole at the back, at the back of his head. Blogger Ikonya asks a very poignant question. How could a moving train slain Albert Lutuli ever so cleanly on the back of the neck? According to the engine driver Latekhan, the train hit Lutuli on the right shoulder and he spun around. Yet there was a deep laceration on the top of his head. Gregerson was more intensive in her report. She stated that there was a jagged laceration at the base of his skull, which was about four to five inches in length on the outer ends. He had a three inch laceration on the center of the occiput. There was an abrasion, a laceration on the right perital region, a fractured elbow, ribs were fractured on both sides, and there was a laceration in the lower leg. The last point to make about Lutuli's death is that the president of the National Congress was never supposed to walk alone. Presidents of the African National Congress are like that famous football team, you never walk alone. In Zulu culture itself, a chief never walks alone. The state therefore robbed the chief of the protective mechanism that attends to chiefs as, benefit, as fringe benefit of the position they hold in society. The greatest threat to the revelation of a scandal is usually not when the scandal itself is committed, but when it is covered up. It is in covering up that in the inconsistencies of the various explanations surfaced. After the assault by prison warder, Lutuli was taken to hospital, and immediately the weak heart plays into the dimensions of neglect. The first one is that Lutuli was not physically strong, and therefore was not supposed to, this, to be this macho leader that he was, he was because of the absence of, 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 of his strength. The assassins or harassers of whatever ideological um, uh, persuasion are always seen as the detritus of society. The big fish always escape. That is, thus it was that when Kenyan politician Tom Boyer was assassinated, the assassin, upon being questioned, asked why he was being singled out instead of the investigators to also ask the big men. Dimitri Safenders, who assassinated apartheid Prime Minister Fervut, in full cabinet of his view, was deemed to be mentally unstable. Incidentally, an earlier attempt on Fervut's life was also ascribed to a deluded farmer who had neurotic behavior. Princip, who assassinated Archduke Ferdinand to ignite the First World War, was known as a fanatic. Mondlane's assassination was ascribed to Frelimo dissidents. The right-wingers who accosted Lutuli were, were dismissed as hooligans. Some of the assassinated leaders had some promotions about their deaths. Malcolm X showed a lot of concern about his family, indicating that he was not going to be around for a long time. Martin Luther King had seen over the mountain. Lumumba tried to escape, but he was cornered on the banks of the impassable Sankuru River and captured. Sylvanius Olympio was shot a few meters from the US Embassy where he was escaping to try to seek refuge. Lutuli also had a premonition. In his undelivered statement at the trial of the burning of his pass, he said, what the future has in store for me, I don't know. I only pray to the Almighty to strengthen my resolve so that nothing may deter me from striving. It is now 50 years later since that mysterious death, and the family has had no closure. Let us not, as Africans, allow for the calls for the fresh investigations to be those which bring closure to the dominant sections of our people, like the calls that are being made by another investigation into the Helderberg disaster, a flight disaster, flight 295 in 1987. There should be concomitant calls for the revisitation of the manner and the circumstances under which Lutuli was killed. The resolution of cold cases through DNA, 
dental identification, carbon dating, and a lucky detective makes TV series sell, but they cannot be used to get to the source of why, who, and how Lutuli was assassinated. Alfred Noformella, to save his skin, told the world before he was hanged, the day before he was hanged, otherwise we would have not known about the deaths of Mkwenge. I believe somewhere in our country, there are people who are, who are ready to talk, who can bring some light on the subject of Lutuli. Finally, I want to go back to the phraseologies I started with. On the issue of Lutuli's death, there is a possibility of letting bygones be bygones if the whole truth is told. The family acknowledges the that the, the possibility of prosecution is remote. If there are people whose wounds are still opened, it is the Lutulis. Closing them will take the effort of the information about his death if the people who, brought, who, who killed him are brought forward. Of course, it will not forget just as all of us cannot forget. A single nation cannot be built on the crucible of 1994 elections. There was a history before that, and part of that history is a manga manga story about the mysterious death of Chief Lutuli. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, on your behalf, I'd like to say thank you very much indeed uh, to Dr. Mzalia. Uh, death by train, the manga manga story of uh, Chief Albert Lutuli's death, and it indeed is a very curious case. It does seem that there's a compelling uh, circumstantial evidence, uh, for want of a better word, that perhaps uh, points to some inconsistencies uh, with the inquest that uh, was, uh, was done and the findings thereof. And uh, perhaps, this, particularly when you consider uh, the list of assassinations that uh, you spoke about, when we compare uh, and contrast, it does uh, create some questions. And uh, one that I'll put to you a little bit later is you talked about the uh, the motive, and I'm wondering what that might be. So I look forward to hearing that from you uh, a little bit later on. But there was another aspect of uh, Chief Lutuli that uh, we haven't explored uh, very much, uh, particularly when one looks at uh, uh, his, his life story and, and the books that have been written about him, and that he was, he was a Christian. Um, Chief Lutuli's grandfather, Ntaba Lutuli, and his grandmother were among the first converts to Christianity, in fact. Uh, Ntaba not only became a, a deacon in the congregational church, but was also the first teacher at one of the congregational church schools in Hurtville. So this kind of was what was in his family already. And I guess the question that we're asking today is, how much of his faith came through in his leadership, particularly when uh, his organization had to grapple with the idea of uh, uh, armed struggle, when he himself was always about uh, uh, peace, uh, um, peaceful means uh, uh, in his struggle, and uh, of course winning that Nobel Peace Prize. So let's find out from uh, Professor Smangaliso Kumalo, who's an associate professor of religion and governance in the School of Religion at the University of KwaZulu Natal, just how much his Christian faith played in his leadership. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you, Program Director, Mr. Peter Ndoro, um, Minister Mtetwa, the Chulu family, my two DVCs here, Professor Porchita from the College of Humanities and Professor Renuka Vital from our Teaching and Learning uh, Department in the University. It is indeed a singular honor for me to have been requested to make a contribution as a panelist in this auspicious lecture commemorating the life and legacy of Inkosi Albert Mvombi Lutuli, Umadlanduna. The question that I am seeking to respond to in this presentation is simply what are the sinews of Lutuli's Christian-centered political leadership? That itself, as we may know, Lutuli identified himself as a Christian. He said of himself that I am in the Congress because I'm a Christian. That itself tells us something of how he defined and understood himself. Never in the history of the struggle against colonization and apartheid did an African leader of struggle bring such clear synergies and compatibility between Christian conviction and political effectiveness. 
In this presentation, I shall focus myself on the existential sources that are religious in character and prophetic in content that informed Lutuli's political reflection and practice. The first was the prophetic non-conformist tradition of the Congregational Church that profoundly molded Lutuli's worldview. The second is the prophetic liberal Christianity Lutuli encountered in his higher education at the Peter Marisbeck uh, Teachers Methodist College and at Adams Teachers College. The third was a prophetic nonviolent but direct action method of social change, which can be attributed to Mahatma Gandhi and also to Lutuli's friend, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King of the civil rights movement in the US. The fourth was that of prophetic civil religion, which was held by most of the founding leaders of the African National Congress, which brought together secular and sacred history and combined Christian theologies of freedom, salvation with political ideals of democracy, human rights for all, and justice and equality for all. In this essay, therefore, I am going to be looking at these four uh, sources which constitute the major pillars of Albert Lutuli's Christian political praxis. Firstly, the prophetic nonconformist tradition of the Congregational Church. Lutuli's journey started on the 31st, March 1799, long before he was born, when the first group of reformed missionaries arrived in South Africa under the auspices of the London Missionary Society. Unlike the rest of the missionaries who were in the country, those that ended up forming Lutuli's church, the United Congregational Church, were firstly interdenominational. Secondly, they were not representative of any particular government or country. Thirdly, they were self-governing and independent. Fourthly, they were proponents of what we call the Reformed theology, which is different from the mainstream theology, which is sometimes used for oppressing and justifying the oppression of other people. They were a free people whose only aim was not necessarily to aid the colonization of people, be it politically or even ecclesiastically. They were free missionaries whose aim at spreading a gospel that would emphasize the freedom of people from any form of control and domination. For as their motto said, they were a society for, promo for promoting the spread of Christ's kingdom. Lutil was a man of deep personal faith, and that guided his life. He was known to pray regularly, to lead the daily family prayers in his home. And when he received the news of his Nobel Peace Prize award, he is said to have withdrawn into his home and spent hours in deep thoughts, prayer, and meditation. That was a unique politician, I can tell you. Elsewhere, I noted that his daughter, Tandega, account, gives an account of her father's faith, was not wavered by the challenges he faced in his life, including when he was banned from joining his church community for worship. She noted that. When he could not go to church, maybe because he was banned, and because he had been banned, he would wake up every morning on Sunday, dress himself up in a suit and a tie, everything formal, sit down and follow the service in the radio, and read his Bible. When they were singing, he would even sing and even conduct the music in the radio, as if the choir was in front of him. Not even the banning orders will stop him from connecting his faith and his community. This was Albert Lutuli's wellspring. It was from this deep personal commitment that he formulated the values he lived for, the approach he took for his struggle in politics and his general outlook in life. However, Lutuli, as indicated earlier, was first a Christian leader before ever becoming a political one. And his faith immensely directed his development into and as a political leader. His participation in the struggle of his, pe his people was determined and motivated by his religious commitment. Participating in the struggle for him was a religious commitment itself. For him, there was no dichotomy between religion and politics. He pointed out that my own age, because I am a Christian, is to get into the thick 
of the struggle with other Christians, taking my Christianity with me and praying that it may be used to influence for good in the character of the resistance. During a visit to the South African delegation in the U.S. in the days of his lecture tour, Lutulu explained, I find it hard to divorce church affairs, affairs from politics. I cannot answer as though the church lived in a political void. Raymond Sartner says Lutulu's fusion of ethics, particularly drawn from his religious values and his politics, as an important reason why Lutulu's life need to be regularly engaged. He argues that Lutulu had a clear direction with political issues, but his religious beliefs informed such direction, and these beliefs are also visibly lived out in his political life. Gerald Pillay assessed that Lutulu made efforts to appropriate and understand Christianity in ways that were contextually relevant, and like Gandhi had done earlier in South Africa and just a few years before in India, he, in the, he, attend, he attempted to practice some of the key injunctions of the Sermon of the Mount. His political speeches are full of Christian ideas and metaphors. Lutul is described as one who made efforts to pass across a new Christianity, which spoke to the experience of the people and which did not separate their faith from their socio-political aspirations. Today we call this theolog contextual theology or to be exact, we call it liberation theologies. His vision of South Africa was one built on godly principles, and in his Christian com commitment would not allow him to respect and follow laws that denied the essential dignity of the person. For him, political involvement was an expression of his Christian princip principles and conviction. Scott Cooper argues to to understand Lutuli's motivation and commitment to the freedom of South Africa from apartheid, one needs to look at his Christian, particularly congregationalism, which were the roots which ran deep and extensive in Lutuli. These defined him in his home, in his school, in his vocation and spiritual life, and in his political life never suppressed these aspects of his being. Congregationalism emphasizes religious, Former political and individual liberty, that, but does not emphasize dogma or creed. Formed in this background, Lutuli did not define his life and activities by religious or dogmatic views. He did not exclude anyone on the basis of their beliefs. What mattered for him was that they were all for the struggle against white supremacy. Thus, he was able to unite people from across religious, ideological, and racial divides within the ANC for the struggle. Lutuli saw his ability to achieve this as the result of his Christianity. He once said, I am confident enough in the Christian faith to believe that I can serve my neighbor best by remaining in his company. Men doubtful about the inner strength of their own cause will put on faith in exclusiveness, discriminatory laws, apartheid, guns. Their fear makes materialists of them. The spirit is weak, and they seek to make the flesh strong. The Christian faith, undiluted, and other creeds which assert justice and humility, whose strength is spiritual rather than material, are strong enough to withstand any onslaught. Albert Lutuli's speeches and statements, especially the one drafted, after he was deposed of his chieftaincy and jointly released by the ANC and the NIC, the road to freedom is via the cross, I close quote. Carried theological and biblical undertones, Cooper argues that documentary evidence, the road to via to the cross originated from and substantially caught a sermon Lutuli had delivered six days earlier at Adams College, titled Christian Life, a Constant Veta. Venture, and thus had a biblical, theological, and homiletic roots. He argues that this has shown that for Lutuli, the fundamental tenets of his faith were primary, the importance, and not only ultimately the success or failure of any given political acti tactic or strategy. And that Lutuli communicated to his political followers the impetus for politics is a calling from God to serve others. 
Cooper also argues that not only did Lutuli see his political engagement as a calling from God to serve his people, he actually invoked a sense of envisioned himself as the biblical Moses. For Cooper, this is evident in his choice of the title for his autobiography, Let My People Go. This was basically interpreted by Cooper to be a fundamentally political rather than political act, and it provides a clue to understanding the life and leadership of the man. To understand the role of the biblical Moses is to understand Lutuli. Thus, Lutuli saw himself as obedient rather than successful. An ethical as much as if not more than political leader, nonviolent rather than militarist, and even tragic rather than triumphant character in his ability to reach the promised land. He once, Cooper says, the choice of the title also reveals that Lutuli was invoking divinely inspired biblical refrain of Moses to the Pharaoh during the oppression of the Hebrews. Thus, Lutuli also very likely saw himself as a spiritual leader, like Moses who humbly led in obedience despite all his inadequacies. The next point, the prophetic nonviolent by direct action as a method of social change. Lutuli's ability to bring his religious conviction to bear on his political life is also visible in his nonviolent approach to struggling. Although he never saw himself as a pacifist, he believed that nonviolence was the best approach for realizing political goals. This bent towards nonviolence was for religious reasons. Elsewhere, I have argued that Lutuli's stance on nonviolence succinctly, his approach to the struggle was nonviolent but direct action. He believed that violence must be avoided at all costs in favor of what he called extra parliamentary methods of engagement. He traveled throughout the country, preaching the gospel of standing up against the apartheid system, but doing this without engaging in violence. During the treason trial, trial Lutuli, in response to questions concerning his beliefs on nonviolence, he responded, my own beliefs, as I have already said, that a certain extent motivated by my Christian leanings. Because of my Christian leanings, I would hesitate to be a party to violence, my lords. I am not a theologian, but my own leanings will be in that direction. Although they are suggesting that Lutuli was ambiguous on his position on nonviolence following the unyielding response of the apartheid government and other developments, such as the launching of the militant wing of the ANC, Umkonto Wesizwe, while he was still president. However, more reliable evidence shows that he held onto his beliefs on nonviolence until death, for violence would not bring peace, but would breathe violence. His understanding on the formation of the armed wing of the Congress was also because people were being brutalized and they did need a movement to defend them. They were already faced with a violent, brutal system that defending yourself was not a choice, but the only option at the time. This does not mean that Lutuli was a believer in violence as a means to solve differences. Lastly, we have seen how Lutuli saw no separation between politics and religion, spirituals versus the material, the sacred versus the secular. We have seen him emphasizing a holistic perspective on life, one that sees and calls us to participate in making a world that is a be better place for all, especially those who understand themselves as people of faith and religion. Therefore, there is no justification when one looks at what Lutulu challenges today. For people who stand on the fence and just point fingers on what's not going right in our political system without being involved on the basis of being Christian or religious. The project of building a strong, comma, credible and successful democracy is for all people, especially those with the moral compass, because they drink from the wells of faith and religion, which goes beyond just political idealism. Such people are expected to be involved in infusing Christian principles and moral character in our body politic. Having an inner world spring for the strength and the motivation, which for Lutuli was the Christianity, is more likely to make one more confident, courageous, resourceful, productive uh, in the political arena. One's religion can be a source of strength 
moral guidance, and something for all to fall back on in times of challenging in political pursuits. Therefore, it has to be understood that his faith was a source of inspiration and energy for his political work. It is therefore not surprising that he made a tremendous impact to the legacy of the ANC. This shows that faith can enable leadership and resilience in the midst of tribulations that come as a result of political work. A balance between politics and religion holds the promise for a better political for, and a better society and more directed and motivated life in the public and private spheres. Drawing from his Christian-centered principles, one must stand against laws and systems that deny their humanity. Government the world over are meant and aimed at enabling justice, peace, and protection of human rights for all people. Part of drawing from the religious resources for political leaders is taking seriously the understanding that politics itself can be a noble profession, one that can be used for to serve humanity. Lutuli saw it as something that can be called for total sacrifice, and he was prepared to give that even if it meant giving away the security of his family and ultimately his life. His life and legacy is summed up in his words, which I'm going to close with. What the future has in store for me, I do not know. It might be ridicule, imprisonment, concentration camp, flogging, punishment, and even death. I only pray to the Almighty to strengthen my resolve, to that one of these possibilities may deter me from striving for the same of the good name of our beloved country, the Union of South Africa, to make it a true democracy and a true union in form and spirit of communities in the land. It is inevitable that in working for freedom, some individuals and some families must take the lead and suffer. The road to freedom is via the cross. Maybe he will say to us, the road to real democracy, where there is justice for all, sharing of resources, equality, and respect for human rights, may his vision and dream inspire us to walk on his footsteps. Long live the spirit of Albert Lutuli. Long live. All right. Uh, Professor Kubala, thank you very much indeed, sir, for sharing your thoughts with us and uh, giving us a sense of the spirit of the man um, and uh, using his faith as, I guess, his roadmap to his leadership and uh, something that we'd like to explore a little bit further. We've got about 30 minutes now, I think, before uh, our viewers are going to leave us. We'll continue with our debate uh, as we carry on uh, after that, but uh, perhaps... Uh, if we can start collecting those questions from our audience, just raise your hand. We'll collect those questions from you, and they can come to me. But uh, let's start exploring uh, some of the issues that have been brought to the fore by our speakers. And I think one that kind of jumped up for all of us is this uh, manga manga story. <laughs> and <laughs> Thanks. All right. So um, I, I just want to ask, you talked about... A motive, because he was a man of peace. He was a man who got a Nobel Peace Prize, um, and he was a man who was not afraid to walk around. So he, he hardly seemed to be a threat. What could have been the motive then to take him out? Yeah, where you are. Okay. Chief Albert Lutuli started doing what the apartheid state had never thought would be done, to bring people together, black and white. That was a threat to the government because it couldn't do it. It did not want to do it. Secondly, he was the leader of the African Congress, and the African Congress was not, was wanted to take over power. And in order to disable the African Congress, why not hit the head of the African Congress? And, and Chief Albert Lutuli was that head. Mm. So simply in politics, opponents destroy each other. Okay. Um... Honorable Minister um, Zeto, I'm just wondering, you know, with this compelling circumstantial evidence that's been raised here, has there been or is there talk that perhaps there's time for another look at this particular story from government? Well, uh, thanks, uh, <coughs> Peter. The issue of the inquest... Um, I've not been in a situation where it's uh, discussed and elucidated the way uh, uh, 
Dr. Mzalia um, has raised. I, I, I recall of no process, maybe it was there before, where there was a, a concentration uh, on that. Uh, but I must say that uh, uh, what uh, Dr. Mzalia has put forth is indeed a well-researched and, mm -hmm. and, and compelling uh, kind of evidence, which is worth looking at. Um, um, as I say, I have not come across any, any evidence mm -hmm. uh, that that has been the route which has been mm -hmm. taken uh, before. All right, so we've got a question from Blessing uh, Mtetwa. Where are you, Blessing? I wonder if you're related to Minister. <laughs> Blessing, where are you? Stand up. Let's get a microphone to you. There we go. Uh, let's get a microphone to Blessing so that uh, everybody uh, can hear. Uh, if your question is ready as well, please uh, just raise your hands and we'll get, we'll get those questions to you. Thank you, Mr. Program Director. Uh, I'm from Crowdville. So my question is simple. Um, Chief Lutuli, when he met with an accident, he became unconscious. And he was taken to hospital. When he was in OPD department, he regained his consciousness. And his son asked him, who did this to you, Dad? And Chief Lutuli did not answer him directly. Instead, he said he is feeling terrible pains on the back and on the side. After that, he died. <clears throat> so now my question is, if he was knocked by the train, how come is it that the wound was only on the back and the pains were on the side? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Would you like to comment on that? <laughs> I suppose that supports your theory. <laughs> um, I, I, would, I would say if I had a chance to speak to uh, the speaker before I wrote the paper, mm. I would have interrogated him more on this issue and perhaps it could, it could be included. I would like to invite the speaker for a further discussion on this issue. Mm. The, the stories from, from, from the pathologist from the people who were at the, at, 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 the, at the scene of the accident, are, are, are clashing, as, 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 as I said earlier. Some people were saying there was only one wound. Others were saying there were, there were not. It was found with searches on the head. And they, already they had, started, they had stitched him. Now, when a person is, is, is unconscious, the first thing that you do is try and revive him. And the, the, the searches will come in later. So there's a whole lot of story. And as I said earlier, in the covering up, that's where the lies get exposed. And I would like us to engage further on the issue to enrich, mm -hmm. to enrich the paper that I've written. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Mzalia, wh why do you think this story perhaps hasn't got the traction that it should have got? You know, the Biko stories came out and, and it had more traction for some reason than others. Why, why, why not this one? It's a... It's a difficult one, Peter. One, the people who, who killed Lutuli also owned the means of communication. Therefore, it could not be distributed. It, 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 sorry, that, that information could, could, could not go to people, and they could not be interrogated. Secondly, the SPs at that time were brutal, and there might be people who, did, who do know, but they were afraid to speak. I think there are people even now who are still afraid to speak 47 years later, I wish I could tell people, just talk and let, let us have this f truth about what actually happened. And, I, and uh, understanding the family, hmm. there won't be any prosecution. So if you've got the facts, come forward. There's, the generation may not be there, but oral history, people will tell their, their children. I've mentioned so many people, um, NS and Vega, for instance. Where are the people who were with uh, the, the, the generations of Ernest Ferger? There is an interesting chap, the ambulance driver, Papaya. 
Where is the family of papaya? Because they must be telling us what their, their father or their grandfather knew about, about the issue. I argue, therefore, that it is not going to be coming from your DNA testing and stuff like that. If you are waiting for the documentation to be, un, to be declassified, you won't get any information there because they destroyed it. Mm -hmm. What they did, say, in 19, 1992, thereabout, there was a law that said, coming from the security, uh, security cluster of government, destroy anything that has got to do with our past transgressions. Mm. Instead of burning paper, they asked ISCO to stop melting iron and just melt and just destroy all, pay, all, all, all evidence. But even then, even in that act, something remained for the TRC to proceed with its work. Mm. So I'm still, I'm, I'm still convinced that somewhere there is information. In fact, the last piece of information which I was discussing with my colleague is a document that was found in the late Judge Didcot's um, uh, garage. It tells us a lot of story about Lutuli's non-racialism, his, his, his fight against tribalism. Mm. So I believe that the information is there. One last point I want to make. If we can say we would like to make research on the land restitution going back to 1913 and even, going, even beyond now with, with, with the revision of the Act, what could stop us from getting information of something that happened in 1967? Mm. Thank you. Sometimes we get clues uh, at looking at modus operandi. So if it fits a pattern of other crimes similar, uh, we might say or draw conclusions that maybe this is the work of a certain body. Is there, are there other precedents where people were placed in front of, in front of trains in a similar manner? Um, not, not of the leaders I know, um, but there were various ways of, of uh, eliminating, eliminating leaders. As I, as I talked about mm. Mubiwe of, of, of the Cameroon, it was poisoning, for instance. Um, um, Lumumba, there was first a trial of, of trying to poison him. Um, it, 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 did, it didn't help. And there were there, a number of methods. Some of them mm. were brutal. And my, my observation is that in that era where the, the SPs or the security people at the time were composed of black and white, it was the blacks that were, that were more brutal than, than their white bosses in order to prove their loyalty. So I still think, at the shop, mm. NS Fergo was, was working at the shop, says there is a man who came to tell them first that there is a man who has died on the railway train. Then a second unknown man came to say to them, it's Lutuli who had died at the train. Now, it's a small shop, it's not a bazaar. A person who's worked at that shop for a long time would know almost all the customers, but he says, I, I did not know the name mm -hmm. of this person. So there's a problem about so many SPs who were, who, who, who were flying there all, 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 all over. And I believe that there were people who were always trailing Lutuli whenever he went. Those people were never, never called before the inquest. Okay. Seven Zilinyao, uh, where are you? You have a question. Seven Zilinyao. Uh, good evening, Peter. Mm. I'm from Gagreen. Uh, my answer was, how did they want his family to suffer? Why they want his family to suffer? And is there any way they can find how his case ends? Uh, because our children, they want to know how did Lutuli died? How will his case end? We don't have an answer because we don't know. So I want to clear all those questions so the children, they can learn because they learn in school. Some other children, they pick up at school to go to Lutuli Museum to learn about Museum Lutuli. So all that I want to know to tell the children what's happened to, to uh, Albert Lutuli. So my question is, how did, uh, my question is, did the way that he was working was very dangerous? You know, they said uh, it was hit by the train, mm. but it was his first day or it was a usually he used to work mm. there. Okay. Thank you. All right, well, let's find out. So this, this was a route that was familiar to him, wasn't it? 
And I suppose another question that comes to mind is, how possible it, was it that he was the only person there at that time? Surely there must have been someone uh, walking, observing from across the road. He couldn't have been alone at that time at a railway track, surely. Um, that, that is, I think I said in my paper, mm. a chief, although he, although he had been deposed, he was still a chief to his people. Mm. So he was not supposed to walk alone. He never walked alone. He was not supposed, but, but because, of, or because of, or, 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 of the punishment. To come to the question which, which the lady is, mm. is, is, is asking, this is, a, this is work in progress. It's reviving something that has been set aside and not discussed, largely because the publishing houses and the spaces for people like us are not created to debate these things. This is in, in colleges, this is in universities, are decided by professors who already have this received notion that Lutuli was killed by a train, full stop. And if you make proposals, if you write proposals to, to try and do your PhD on these issues, you get the professor saying it can't be done, or the funder is, they say change your title or something like that. It's very, very difficult to research this issue. All right. Perhaps the Department of Arts and Culture will come to the party. <laughs> You'd like to add? Yeah, I, I just wanted to add perhaps very briefly to say, I mean, the one question that you kept raising is why this time? Mm. The one quick point to make is that surely it was, as Dr. Bzalio was pointing out, it was not only a national phenomenon that after the Second World War, uh, opponents were eliminated. You can take examples in quite a number of countries. In 53, for instance, Iran suffered a coup that saw a dictator that remained there until 1979. That coup was actually engineered in some capital. Somebody quite prominent mm. from the United States by the name of Roosevelt was sent over to stage that coup. So there was a regime change mm. as early as 53. Within the African continent, you would actually have quite a number of examples. But if you go south mm. into South America, that seems to be the case. But then the tail end of that question is why? I think it's important to point out that in 1966, Edward, is it, uh, Robert Kennedy came over here at a time when they thought that isolated Lutuli completely and he was not going to be any factor anywhere. Now, to have actually uh, received that kind of attention at the time when the apartheid regime uh, believed that they'd silenced him and they were actually pushing the liberation movement on the back foot, surely must have actually pushed people mm -hmm. who were now uh, in the practice of eliminating and assassinating opponents. The one context as well that you may lose, mm. if you look at the statistics of people who died in prison from the early 60s to the mid 70s, under a range of, exam of, of excuses, you can see a steady increase of these numbers, culminating, I think, in more than 50 by the early 80s. So it's within that context that you should mm. understand how your leader of the African National Congress as the head of the liberation movement at the time got eliminated. All right. I'm going to come to you. Um, maybe you can comment, but also uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, his Christianity. And I'm just wondering, how difficult was it to be a Christian at that time if you were a chief, particularly when you consider sometimes your traditional values are at odds with this faith that had been brought in by some people we might have even considered as uh, colonialists and oppressors. So he's sitting as a chief on the one hand and the custodian of some deep traditional values, and yet he's also wearing this hat as a Christian. How difficult was him perhaps to balance that? And that's even before we talk about armed struggle. Thank you. Maybe just a, by way of yeah. comment to, to the reason why the system would have wanted him dead. Firstly, Lutuli brought validation and prestige to the movement. The fact that he had won the Nobel Peace Prize, being the first continental African to win that, coming from this movement, which at the time was uh, seen as a, a, a bunch of fire-eating angry guerrillas who have no, no substance, and suddenly behind them appears this man of peace, but who is pushing the same agenda. By doing that, he was bringing so much recognition and prestige to the struggle 
of the South African people, especially the liberation movement. So anyone then who was an enemy of the struggle would want to kill him. I just wanted to raise that point. It is the, the question you are raising also of how difficult it was to be a chief. Firstly, it wasn't really difficult for Lutuli because Lutuli was not a traditional chief. He was a chief in, the, in what was known then as the community of believers, Amakolo. And Groutville has got that legacy of having been a community of people who are Christians, they come from that background, they are influenced by the teachings of Reverend Alden Kraut and the other people from, who came from the, the, the congregational church and all that. So in terms of culture, and all, he had already moved in terms of his own understanding of culture. He, he was already an educated man. That's why, in fact, understanding him as one who came to the movement as a, a person who did not just get carried to the movement to be nurtured in the movement. He came walking. He was a teacher, he was a preacher, he was a chief, he was all this. So he had already accumulated the skills and resources that you need to hold the two together mm. into a creative tension. But, yeah. but I think we must add that the, the, the struggle for freedom uh, in our country, especially led by the liberation movement, was at a moral high ground compared to the oppressors. Mm. And because of that, and because of the attitude of the world against the, the regime at the time, there was no other person to be a target for the enemy mm -hmm. uh, rather than the head of the movement. So that in itself, him as part of this collective, that whilst the, the regime would have seen uh, members of the, of, the, of the movement as guerrillas and so on, but generally, the, the public, the masses of our people believed that this movement is the liberator. Mm. So for the enemy, that was a major threat. Yes. I'd also like to add that uh, Lutuli was not an oddity in terms of Christian, being Christian and a political, and a political leader. The first president of the ANC was, 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 was a reverend, mm. even bigger than Lutuli mm. in, terms of, in, ter in terms of his church. Um, uh, there were Reverend Kalatas, there were Reverend, so, so, so many Reverends, uh, Reverend Machaban, uh, and yes. quite a number, a number of, so it's, it's, it, was, it wasn't odd. Mm -hmm. I think that line comes from an overemphasis of Lutuli as a Christian mm -hmm. and not a, 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 not, a, not mm -hmm. a politician. Mm -hmm. But All he right. was both. Okay, so he's a man who's got Nobel Peace Prize, mm -hmm. and he, he talked about nonviolence. Mm -hmm. Very much. How difficult was the conversation then when a, a young, vibrant uh, Nelson Mandela comes to him and he says, Chief, we have to form MK. <laughs> <laughs> Look, the, 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 there is yes. one notion which I think must be yeah. dispelled yeah. about uh, Chief Lutul. Mm. That um, a, a, a notion of him being a pacifist mm is raised, which is not true. Yeah. Um, that uh, he was quite a courageous leader mm -hmm. and, and a man of, uh, of, of his movement. And the preaching of peace has always been the policy of the African National mm -hmm. Congress. As the head of the African National Congress, he was articulating what the movement has been articulating over a period of time. Even when there was a change for, uh, to adopt the armed resistance, um, many theories have been said, but there's never been a situation where Chief Lutulu would say, no, I stand opposed to what my organization is saying. I don't understand this thing of uh, armed resistance. There's never been such a situation, mm. but what has been emphasized is by people who have wanted to create a particular picture, exactly as the doctor is saying there, divorcing its president from its organization, mm -hmm. and even creating in the minds of people that this is the first Christian, this is the first reverend in the African mm -hmm. National Congress and so on. It all has been a propaganda. Do right. yeah. so you want to add to that? Yes, I, I just wanted to articulate and add the same, same sentiments that actually, 
the, the, the ANC itself, when you go behind the, the founding uh, members, <laughs> maybe even say fa- fathers, if you may say, and mothers were there, the, the, people, the mission educated elites, it started with those people. Um, a, a whole lot of them. You, you mm-hmm. can, Pisley Isaga Sam, the, the brain behind the ANC, himself comes from Inanda, himself having grown from the school there, the mission churches and all that, having an illustrious history of that. The presidents in 1912, the president and the deputy presidents and all that, they are lay preachers, they are ordained people, and the list goes on and on. So it's true, in fact, to say that there is a tradition of Christianity in the movement. And Albert Lutuli articulated it to another level, mm-hmm. something that was already there. All right. Very just brief comment, because I'm watching time. Just to add, the African National Congress, the, the inaugural conf- con- 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 conference, was held in a church. The song that nearly became a national anthem, mm. Lizali Sitting Alago, mm. was sung there. Because Sigalela came in much later. Mm. So I, I want to emphasize, I want, I want to agree with you that okay. church and, and, and Christianity, if you go to every, almost many houses, you'll see a green, black, and yellow sitting next okay. to okay. Umanyan, next to Uniformi Umanyan. Yeah. In the right. Okay, we're going to pause for just a moment <laughs> because unfortunately... Uh, At this time, we're going to have to say goodbye to our television audience that have been watching us on Channel 404 uh, across South Africa and uh, also other countries, uh, uh, I think about eight nations that are watching this uh, particular lecture. Thank you very much indeed for watching, and uh, we hope to bring you the rest of it uh, in the near future because we're going to continue to record this uh, session of the uh, uh, Chief Albert Lutuli Annual Lecture. Thank you very much for watching us, and uh, uh, we're going to take a quick break, and after that, Aubrey and Porfi will continue with uh, your news on Channel 404. As an island, the Republic of Extra Call, 29 December. Get your tickets now. Enjoy your PlayStation 4 games on your smartphone with PS4 Remote Play. Don't settle for good, demand great. The new Sony Xperia Z3 series. Get the new Sony Xperia Z3 Compact on a My MTN Choice 100 contract for only $399 and get a free 12-month music stream subscription. Many thanks once again uh, to my colleague Peter Ndoro for that uh, special broadcast on the annual Chief Albert Lutuli Memorial Lecture currently going on at the Westville campus of the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Devon. Right now it's 1500 hours Central African time and good afternoon once again and if you're just joining us a warm welcome to this Saturday edition of your PM News live from Johannesburg with me Aubriel Mpopo. Let's go straight to take a look at our top stories this hour. President Jacob Zuma says the Tripartite Alliance partners need to redefine their common plans and also set out specific programs to accelerate service delivery. Nigerian President Goodluck Jonathan vows to hunt down those behind mosque attacks 
which left at least 120 people dead. And also coming up in your sports, uh, defending the champions Planet Nam Stars are looking to keep their title when they face Supersport United. At the same time, Supersport United also looking to make it third time lucky in the Telcom knockout final. There you have the live visuals coming to you from Orlando Stadium. The pressure. Well, Rogers and, Daniel... and now straight on to our top story, the Tripartite Alliance partners need to redefine their common plans and also set out specific programs to accelerate service delivery. That's according to President Jacob Zuma. He was speaking at the South African National Civic Organization at a gala dinner in Durban last night. The National Civic Organization fundraises for the poor. Its roots are deeply entrenched in community service. Speaking at the event, President Zuma denounced non-cooperation in the alliance. He said if the tripartite alliance partners were fighting for a common cause on the ground, government wouldn't be misunderstood on accelerating service delivery. We needed to sit back and say our different formations must focus on specific issues. We needed to work out programs that are clear. There are things we have not done. We have not, for an example, dealt with South Africans to move away from the mindset of saying, if you demand something, you need to break things. The president then called on Sanko not to compete with the ANC in the branches. Sanko must continue to take up 